you want to wait for a minute or two, or you want to start? Yeah, we'll start. Uh, four oh one. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for all those people who are here uh, in person and those who have joined us online. Um, so this is the beginning of our uh, weekly grand rounds for 2022-2023. And um, I'm sure all will have a wonderful experience over the next uh, uh, nine months or so. And uh, thanks to um, Copper for arranging the pediatric uh, endocrine lectures and to um, carry uh, for arranging the molecular endocrinology uh, uh, lectures for us. So um, I will start off today uh, with uh, a talk on incretins and twincretins, the uh, evolving physiology, pathophysiology and pharmacologic applications. And the reason I chose this topic was because one, uh, this is a growing field. There's something that has happened over the last uh, few years, which really has changed a, a lot of our thinking on um, the cardiometabolic disorders. And also when I talk to um, uh, the uh, residents and fellows and students, uh, I find that uh, the, the full understanding of what uh, these uh, uh, incretins are and what GLP and GIP are um, needs uh, further um, you know, kind of uh, explanation and delineation. So I thought I will uh, talk about this. Um, so I have um, no disclosures uh, for this uh, talk. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a historical background, uh, and that is important for understanding why these things are called GLP and GIP, uh, because uh, and what is an incretin, because um, the names are a bit confusing as to actually what they eventually do and how they are being applied at this time. And then we'll discuss some of the uh, pathophysiology uh, in diabetes and uh, obesity, and then, of course, um, their applications in terms of the treatment of uh, uh, several cardiometabolic disorders. So one of the things about the uh, history of uh, incretins is that uh, this is actually the history of endocrinology. You know? uh, in a way, uh, the term hormones was first uh, uh, introduced kind of by uh, Dr. Starling. Uh, and I must uh, tell Dr. Uh, Williams that Starling is not a cardiologist, he's a physiologist, and he's an endocrinologist. Uh, because he used to define the term hormones in this uh, lecture uh, where he talked about um, the experiments that they had done with Bayless and Starling uh, had performed uh, to show what happens when you introduce something that is um, into the stomach and extracts of the um, you know, stomach and duodenum, how it works without the nervous system. Because... Prior to that, uh, it was considered that all uh, regulation was through the nervous system, and they showed that uh, you can regulate things uh, through the blood, and that's how they came up with the term hormones, uh, which um, you know, translated to I excite or arouse. Um, so, you know, this was the first time that, that the term was used uh, at this lecture. Now, this is the experiment which really... Uh, not only tells you the story of hormones, but also the story of incretins, because this was the experiment that Bayless and Starling published in the Journal of Physiology um, back in 1905. Um, and this, um, what they had done here was that they showed that the secretion of pancreatic juice um, that is evoked by uh, the entrance of acid chyme into the duodenum um, and they showed that even if you denervate the pancreas, that this will happen. And so they had this uh, extract uh, that they were able to inject and then show that um, there is an increase in pancreatic secretion that uh, stimulates pancreatic juices, and they call this thing uh, secretin. So that is how the original um, idea that something from the, um, you know, the gastrointestinal tract, uh, the stomach and the ordinum, was actually working on the pancreas. 
And subsequently, you know, uh, there is a long history of how these different things came about. And it was in 1929 that this name was, uh, Incretin was actually named. I'll show you that uh, paper. And then it was in the 1960s that the Incretin effect, as we now call it, was actually demonstrated. And then in the 1970s, uh, two different things. One is the um, demonstration of GIP's insulinotropic functions, and then subsequently in the 1980s, uh, GI GLP's in insulinotropic function were uh, demonstrated. And um, some of these were uh, animal experiments and some of them were human. So these ones here, um, these are you know uh, things that were uh, done in uh, animal models, and these are all done in humans. So there has been a, a significant amount of progress. And then in the 2000s, there's, uh, there was a growth in this uh, field uh, with the development of uh, pharmaceutical agents like the DPP-4 inhibitors, uh, which uh, led to the um, increased GLP levels and uh, causing an improvement in uh, ILAC function. Subsequently, uh, the GLP-1 analogs uh, and also the demonstration uh, of cardiovascular benefits of some of the GLP-1s. And today we are talking about um, both GLP-1 and GIP and how multi-agonists uh, can have an impact on both metabolic control and also on cardiovascular outcomes. So there has been a hundred plus years of progress in this field. And many of these things are something that was not predicted when they originally identified this. Uh, none of these uh, were thought of as possible. So in the early uh, study of these things, the, the, the incredible concept, uh, this was first in 1906 that they, Moore and colleagues, they hypothesized that gut extracts contain a hormone uh, that regulates endocrine pancreas, and demonstrated the administration of gut extracts reduces the amount of urine sugars in patients with diabetes, uh, presumably through stimulation of the endocrine pancreas. So you must remember that at this time, insulin had not been discovered. So you know, they didn't even know what insulin was. So in 1929, um, Labar uh, purified the glucose-lowering element of gut extracts and named it as incretin. Uh, that is the intestine secretion uh, of insulin. So that was what uh, the term that he used. But one of the things was that because there was no good and easy to uh, measure method of um, uh, insulin assays, um, this kind of was in the background until the 1960s when they actually uh, started measuring in insulin levels in people with diabetes and those who were not diabetic. So a lot of the physiology of uh, insulin secretion uh, is after 1960s when we learned how to measure um, insulin by radio immunoassay. So this is the paper that is most coded in terms of what uh, an incretin effect is. So this uh, by McIntyre, um, Holdsworth, and Turner, uh, they were the ones who did these studies um, at the Royal Free Hospital in London. And these are uh, studies looking at intravenous glucose and intrajuginal glucose and looking at the glucose responses and the insulin responses. And this is a continuous infusion of, um, uh, of glucose. And this one is a bolus infusion of uh, glucose. And what you see here is that when you gave um, intravenous glucose, the blood sugars went up more um, as opposed to giving uh, by the uh, jejunal route. On the other hand, when you look at the insulin response, there was a greater insulin response with the jejunal route uh, rather than the um, intravenous route. And you can see that similar thing that you will see when you give a bolus of glucose. So they concluded that there is something in the intestine, that is that the intestinal factors uh, control insulin secretion. Um, one of the things that was there was that, you know, didn't know what exactly this uh, thing was. They knew that these extracts had something in them. And um, there was this concept that there is something, in, a hormone in the intestine, which, they, which was analogous to 
uh, secretin, which they called it as uh, enterogastrin. So there was um, an effort to try and find out what uh, it is. And one of the things was that the early studies, they showed that um, a purified preparation of this was causing suppression of gastric function, and which is the reason why uh, this term gastric inhibitory peptide or GIP was introduced. So a few years after this extract being called uh, as GIP, um, they found out you know, two investigators, um, Krutfels and uh, Grossman, they showed that this does not happen. There is no inhibition of uh, gastric uh, secretion or motility by this extract. So you know, people lost interest in it. Uh, but the term gastric inhibitory peptide or GIP remained. So this was still called GIP. Now Turner, who you remember from the first experiments which he did with uh, Incretin, um, he had met with Brown and Dupre uh, at a meeting and they had identified three new polypeptides uh, named GIP, VIP, and motilin. So he got uh, these samples, uh, came back to England, and then uh, studied them for insulinotropic effects because that's the thing that they were interested in. They were interested in what is an incretin, you know. And he found that GIP was at least 100 times more potent than a, another uh, compound that he had um, extracted, uh, which he called insulin-releasing peptide, which turned out to be not true, uh, but this was the one that they found. So GIP became, um, so he changed the name from gastric inhibitory peptide to glucose-dependent insulinotropic uh, polypeptide. So it still is called GIP, it's just not gastric inhibitory peptide anymore, it is glucose-dependent insulinotropic uh, polypeptide. Now, what happened subsequently was that um, the interest in GIP uh, became less as people recognized that there was something in the intestine uh, that was similar to glucagon. You know, uh, this is um, these are studies again done mostly in London, uh, and uh, this is Dr. Ellis Samuels who led some of these uh, initial studies. Samuels was our chief of endocrinology, I think, from 1974 to 1994. Uh, here in Louisville, and he and his colleagues, Vince Marks, uh, they had worked on um, what is called as enteroglucagon. They had identified that there is a glucagon-like immunoreactivity in the gut, and if you injected it, that, you know, they had shown previously that injecting glucagon increases insulin secretion, and injecting this particular uh, uh, purified extract was also uh, causing an increase in insulin secretion. And they called it enteroglucagon or glucagon, gut glucagon. Uh, and so people were interested in this uh, particular compound because it was similar to glucagon. People were very familiar with glucagon. And that's how this became a much more uh, popular uh, thing uh, to study. And in the 1980s, uh, it was purified and uh, sequenced, and that's how the term glucagon-like peptide came out. So GLP-1 and GLP-2, these are glucagon-like peptides that were identified uh, from uh, the initial studies. Um, and kind of GIP remained in the background, and GLP became the more uh, important one that um, everyone was uh, studying. So GIP and GLP are from two separate uh, genes. GLP comes from the proglucagon gene, and uh, at two different sites, like in the pancreas, the proglucagon gene will make uh, GL, uh, make glucagon uh, where, uh, and glucagon-like peptide two, and in the intestine you'll get GLP one. Um, so uh, whereas in the intestine you have uh, the GIP gene. Uh, which will make uh, GIP. So these are um, two different genes made from two different uh, sets of cells. So they are secreted in response to nutrients in a meal, and um, the, the secretion of GIP is 
from the proximal uh, intestine, whereas the um, secretion of the uh, GLPs are from the distal intestine. There are two separate sets of cells. The K cells uh, secrete GIP, and the L cells make GLP. And um, for this, they have transporters. Um, so the transporters that transport glucose uh, into these cells are actually um, SGL2, uh, SGLT1s, uh, not the GLUT um, class of uh, transporters, but they are the SGLTs. Uh, like because they are on the epithelial membranes, and just like uh, in the in the kidney uh, and in the intestine, it is through the the SGLTs that the transport of glucose uh, occurs. So you have um, GL, GIP one to forty two, and it has a very short half life. Both of these, in a normal uh, physiology, they're very rapidly inactivated. So they have a half life of GLP has a half life of. Um, two to three minutes, GIP has a half-life of four to five minutes. And then um, they're degraded and uh, to three to 42 and is degraded by DPP-4. And then the degraded um, product is then excreted uh, in the, uh, through the kidney. These um, degraded GIP, the three to 42 and the GLP-1 nine to 37 or the GLP-1 amide uh, are both inactive. So there is a very rapid inactivation of the uh, insulinotropic effects of these uh, incretins. And that's important because of the way some of these drugs have been developed to increase the activity uh, and duration of action of these uh, uh, com uh, proteins. So uh, what actually do they do? So the thing is that they have a wide range of uh, biologic effects. And this is something that we have learned over the last um, 20 to 30 years uh, about the various sites at which they work because as you know initially uh, the focus was all on the pancreas uh, but subsequently there has been an interest in looking at all these different tissues uh, and one has to be a bit careful uh, about understanding um, what they do because many of the studies are not in humans uh, some of them are in um, cell culture, some of them are in whole animals, rats, mice, uh, and sometimes in uh, larger animals. So there is uh, some variation on what might happen in different uh, uh, species. So GIP has an effect um, mainly, of course, on the pancreas. It increases insulin secretion, increases beta cell mass, and increases glucagon secretion. And it also has an impact on fat metabolism. It actually increases fat accumulation. So um, there is increase of triglyceride transport into the adipocytes uh, by GIP. And it also has an, a significant role in postprandial increase in bone formation. So it has you know, one of the uh, effects that it has. Uh, there is some decrease in gastric acid secretion, which is not a, a very large uh, portion of uh, part of its uh, effect. GLP, on the other hand, uh, has an impact on insulin secretion and beta cell mass, and it suppresses glucagon secretion. So there's this difference between the two in terms of what they actually do to glucagon secretion. And it also has some impact on, um, it has some uh, increase in cardiac output and increased cardiac protection. Uh, it does have some impact on heart rate, uh, on sinus node function, and it increases heart rate. And both of them have been shown to uh, have an impact on uh, food intake, uh, mainly with uh, respect to satiety. And there is now growing uh, uh, interest in their effect on memory. So there is a wide range of uh, physiologic effects that are seen with both GIP and uh, GLP. And in addition to the um, food itself, there is a significant role of um, the gut microbiome in the secretion of uh, GLP-1, and also to some degree in the action of GLP-1, particularly with respect to intestinal uh, inflammation. Um, so, you know, many bacterial proteins, bile acids, uh, endotoxins, so there are a number of um, uh, you know, uh, lipopolysaccharides, TLR, I guess, a number of these that are uh, working through the gut um, 
blood barrier uh, so that you know, they have an impact on how these um, uh, hormones actually are secreted and how they actually uh, act on the uh, control of uh, metabolism. Now, what happens in diabetes, this is with respect to what happens to increment effect in people with uh, diabetes. So what you see here is that, you know, um, when you have um, what happens to the uh, glucose levels, so these are individuals in whom uh, you can see these are healthy individuals. Uh, this is oral glucose versus IV glucose. And you will see that in people with diabetes, the incretin effect is blunted. So you have a higher, uh, I mean, a, a decrease in insulin secretion uh, with um, respect to the oral glucose when you compare it with a normal individual. So you can see the robust increase in insulin secretion uh, that occurs in response to a oral glucose load, uh, a somewhat blunted response that you will have with an IV glucose load. And when you look at it from the um, perspective of the person with uh, early type 2 diabetes, this difference is uh, significantly less. So you can see here the peak is very high, and the difference between the peak of the IV and the peak of the oral is very large, whereas here it is pretty much uh, lost. And this is insulin, this is uh, C-peptide. So that is what uh, you're going to see in people uh, with um, diabetes. So there is a blunting of the incretin response to a meal. So taking advantage of this, um, that there is a decrease in um, the incretin response, uh, there was a lot of interest in developing agents that would uh, increase the um, incretin uh, action in uh, you know, using uh, several modifications. So the first of these was actually, you know, developed in 2005 that it, it became available, and that is exenatide or Bieta. So exenatide is a uh, analog, uh, not of GLP-1, but of exendin-4. Exendin-4 is a um, salivary gland um, protein that is released in response to a meal. When the uh, Gila monster bites on a meal, uh, it will release exendin uh, four. Exendin-4 works on the um, GLP-1 receptors, so it is very analogous to the GLP-1. And um, this particular um, thing was identified actually at the Bronx VA, so it's one of the VA products of identifying exendins uh, and developing a compound that would actually uh, work longer. And by modification, and you can see that you know several different techniques have been used to modify these uh, uh, proteins. Uh, this is native GLP-1, and the main thing that has been done for most of these is to change the. This is the site where the DPP-4 will uh, cleave it and make it inactive. So most of the actions are where it is resistant to GLP-1, so DPP-4. So that is what was done with Exendin. Uh, and then you can see here that, you know, uh, with uh, liraglutide, there was a fatty acid that was added uh, to make it uh, more longer acting. Uh, and all of these other things have this uh, particular uh, substitution to prevent the breakdown of the uh, compound uh, of this protein by DPP4 so that it can act longer and can reach higher levels. So in 2005, we had uh, exenatide. Then in 2010, we got uh, liraglutide. Uh, and then you had albiglutide and uh, dulaglutide. Then uh, in 2016, we had lixisenatide. Um, and then we have uh, semaglutide. Um, both uh, initially, it was a subcutaneous injection, later on oral uh, injection. And then, of course, you know, currently, uh, there are, these are all for diabetes. And these products are for use in uh, obesity. So they have used uh, different uh, doses. And of these, you can see that those that are marked uh, uh, here in a different color, uh, they have been approved for use in children. Uh, the others are all approved only for uh, adults. So the, um, the pharmacological um, very, you know, modifications 
have taken advantage of this uh, particular um, protein and its degradation by DPP4 to make it uh, uh, work longer. Now, this simply shows you, you know, all these different compounds and uh, looking at, you know, um, their elimination half-life and how often you have to uh, administer them. And you can see that initially the extendants, um, you know, they had to be used twice daily, then it was made once a day, and then it was once weekly, and then you got the oral formulation, uh, which was once daily. So there has been a lot of modifications of this uh, uh, protein, and uh, I'll talk a bit about how you can make an oral uh, uh, formulation so that the peptide can be absorbed through the GI tract uh, without being broken down. And then, of course, you have the combinations where you have the combination of uh, liraglutide with diglutec, um, which is a fixed-dose combination to be used along with uh, insulin, uh, and this is lixacenatide uh, and insulin combination. So we have these different um, agents, but basically they're all uh, GLP-1 uh, analogs uh, that are used for, uh, you know, uh, control of diabetes. This is simply to um, give you an idea of how these are dosed, uh, that usually they are starting with a smaller dose and then uh, ramping up the dose uh, depending on, um, you know, tolerance and the response. So basically you're using a smaller dose to begin with and go with a higher dose uh, as tolerated. So to give you a summary of all these different drugs, because there are so many new drugs, I won't go through each one of them. What you will find is that um, when you look at these different preparations, uh, these are the short-acting ones and the long-acting ones. The long-acting uh, have the... Um, bigger effect on both uh, A1C, fasting glucose, and body weight reduction. And particularly when you look at um, semaglutide, you know, uh, compared to the short-acting, uh, you have a much larger um, uh, response in terms of, this is a combination of several different trials, uh, including the oral preparation, all of which have a significant effect. And here it shows to you uh, that uh, there is some correlation between the hemoglobin A1C reduction and the reduction in fasting glucose that you have. So, again, what you will see here is that the uh, largest effect that you're going to have is with the longer-acting drugs as compared to the shorter-acting drugs. And this is, again, shown here that, you know, in all of these studies, what you find is whether it is A1C, uh, percent reaching uh, target um, A1C, fasting glucose, or body weight, uh, all of these do favor using a longer-acting drug. So currently, you know, we are using the weekly preparations uh, rather than the um, once-a-day or twice-a-day preparations. So one of the things that to me as, uh, you know, as an endocrinologist, uh, having kind of uh, spent a lot of time uh, working on physiology uh, these are all pharmacologic effects. So, because as you know, the normal physiologic effect of GLPs uh, is only in minutes. It has a very short half-life. It is secreted and responds to a meal. It has, you know, it goes away from the system uh, very quickly. So, you know, there's some difference between what happens physiologically and what happens uh, pharmacologically with these agents. And those are important to recognize, uh, especially since we're going to use it uh, over a prolonged period of time. Now, this is the oral formulation of um, the semaglutide. So this is one of the uh, few drugs which are uh, proteins that are given, um, which are peptides that are given by mouth. So what it is is that, you know, um, this is uh, SNAC, uh, which stands for synthetic and acetylated amino acid derived uh, derivative of salicylic acid. So this actually uh, has some amphilicity. So it, you know, it is buffered, and then the at the higher local pH, um, it is it will protect the uh, semaglutide, and then um, it will fluidize um, lipid membrane, and then gets transported into the uh, through the cell uh, into the circulation. So there's it goes through the transcellular route. So this oral preparation uh, can be used, and in a way, the size uh, of this particular peptide was kind of uh, su uh, best suited for making this type of a pre 
preparation. Not all proteins can be uh, packaged in this way. So uh, it was, you know, th this technology was developed in the 1990s, but they have tried it for different um, proteins, but it worked for um, sem semaglutide. So these are different studies, and you can see here uh, that these studies are pioneer, uh, one, two, three, four, seven, eight, five. You know, so simply to show, this is for early diabetes, established diabetes, and advanced diabetes. And you can see um, the different dose, doses, and you can see that uh, what the response is going to be. So in, in a wide range of uh, uh, situations of different stages of diabetes, it actually causes a significant reduction in the hemoglobin A1C. So, um, you know, ranging anywhere from 0.9 to 1.4. Uh, and again, you know, uh, these are changes in body weight. Um, so you can see, um, you know, some of these effects are um, very similar to what you can get with the glutide. Uh, some of them have been in combination with sulfonylurea or with the, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. So there have been different combinations that have been used. And overall, it does show that it has, a, it retains its uh, activity and it has both a uh, glycemic, uh, no, uh, blood sugar lowering effect and a weight reducing effect. So this shows you what is the relationship between the concentration of the drug and what happens to the, um, you know, uh, change in the A1C. So what you have here is that with the smaller doses of the drug, you have less uh, concentration, and these are the subcutaneous injections, and you can see that the high dose of the oral medication, this is your median responses, and you can see that the subcutaneous dose will give you more of a response, but the maximum dose of 14 milligrams in the oral and the 0.5 get a similar median uh, response. So it is effective um, both as an oral agent and as a subcutaneous uh, injection. Now, the story of GIP is a bit more complicated because uh, GIP was not known to have uh, too many other uh, effects. And over the last 10-15 um, years, there has been a lot of change in our understanding of uh, what GIP uh, actually does. And here you can see here, you know, it was, um, you know, it was sequenced. And one of the things that was noted early in the 70s was that it increases lipoprotein lipase activity in pre um and, you know, increased glucose-dependent insulin secretion, uh, which basically how the uh, name came about. Then you have the, uh, you know, demonstration of uh, reduced incretin effect, and they showed the GIP. Uh, there is an um, increase in insulin um, uh, receptor affinity, so it actually increased uh, the sensitivity of um, the body to uh, insulin. And this was sequenced here in uh, 1981. Then you have the uh, discovery of some of these um, things in the activity in the uh, adipocyte. And it's only in the last uh, 10 years or so that, you know, there has been a lot of activity trying to understand what actually it does, um, trying to see if it has a role in you know, cardiovascular function, adipocyte function, uh, in addition to its effects on glucose, uh, how it regulates uh, appetite um, and bone formation. So, and it has not been as clear cut as to what exactly it does. So if you look at it from the point of view of um, what its physiologic effects are, postprandially, what it does is it increases heart rate, it increases insulin secretion, its effects on glucagon secretion are glucose dependent. Um, so if you don't have much glucose, it is not going to increase insulin secretion. There is an increase in uh, triglyceride uptake and an increase in blood flow. Uh, and in bone, it uh, decreases bone resorption and it increases bone formation in the postprandial uh, state. And in people with diabetes, um, it doesn't seem to, uh, this particular thing about what GIP's role is in regulating heart rate, we don't know. Uh, it does have a decreased insulinotropic effect. So one of the things that is known about GIP is that 
when you look at individuals with um, diabetes and you're looking at GLP-1 secretion and GIP secretion, GLP-1 secretion is decreased in diabetics, but GIP secretion is not. However, GIP action is decreased. So uh, it looks like that in diabetes, there is resistance to GIP uh, and, and decreased action of GIP, uh, not as much of a decrease in secretion itself. And there is a decrease in suppression of glucagon um, that occurs in people with diabetes. And this again is variable, and this is also variable. Uh, as you know, there is now a uh, interest in looking at bone um, uh, changes in people with diabetes. And uh, one of the uh, mechanisms by which uh, bone formation is regulated uh, in the postprandial state is through GIP. So there is some interest in seeing how exactly uh, these will work. Now, one of the things when GLP became popular in using for diabetes, there was still some controversy as to whether what GIP does and whether it can or cannot be used as a drug. And in fact, you know, some of the prominent uh, individuals working in this field, um, this is a paper from 2004, and you can see that, you know, they had serious doubts, you know, um, you know, so here they say here, therefore, therapeutic strategies based on either augmenting or antagonizing GIP action are far from being established alternatives for the future therapy of diabetes or obesity. So, you know, people thought that this is not going to work because it has effects which are kind of work both ways in terms of what it does to obesity. So in rodent models, one of the things it does is actually increases body weight. So they thought that it's not a good idea to give uh, GIP because it, it, it will make you gain weight. You know? um, beta cell mass had not been studied. Uh, and then you know, they found no effect on gastric emptying. So there was all this question as to whether this will um, work or not. You know? There's also, um, again, you know, this is another paper that was published in 2002. Um, you know, GIP seems to play an important role in lipid metabolism, promoting disposal of ingested lipids, and mice with targeted deletion of GIP receptor do not become obese when uh, exposed to high-fat diet. So antagonistic analogs of GIP may be speculated to have pharmaceutical uh, and a role in the pharmaceutical management of obesity. So this was like, you know, uh, which is the, exactly the opposite of what we would say now. So um, there was a lot of confusion about what exactly GL, GIP uh, was uh, doing. So, you know, this was, um, you know, a, a nice review uh, looking, and this is very recent, but it talked about how this conflict is there. Should we antagonize or agonize uh, GIP? Now, should we, for obesity, what should we do? And um, even to this day, there is, you know, uh, data is a bit more complicated on how it might work. And um, Jonathan Campbell and others have this uh, hypothesis. There are two hypotheses that they have. One is that um, if you, you know, this is the normal condition, and if you agonize it, that means an agonist is going to actually um, downregulate the uh, GIP uh, receptor and eventually will lead to uh, more action of GLP-1. So it will maintain uh, metabolic homeostasis, or it will actually work as an antagonist over time. It's like giving you know, GNRH, GNRH analogs or something. So you know, it's, it, was, it was not entirely clear as to how exactly uh, these uh, uh, drugs are going to work. And I think it, the final answer on this is still not there exactly what it does. So that brings us to this particular uh, drug, which is tirzapatide. So this is a twin cretin. So this was a term that was coined uh, because it has two incretins, um, which were actually considered twins, GIP and GLP, uh, were considered twins because from the uh, 100 years ago, uh, they were actually in the same extract that had been isolated. And, it, you know, it has a, it's a dual GLP-1 and uh, GIP receptor agonist. So it has an impact on 
both uh, glucose metabolism and body weight. And this simply shows you, you know, what the different uh, alterations that have been made. There are uh, three, you know, four different fragments that are put together uh, to kind of balance the GLP, GIP activity. GIP is more than the GLP activity of this uh, particular uh, uh, peptide and uh, to make it more long acting. Um, so that is uh, what is uh, being uh, currently uh, developed and uh, approved for use for diabetes. And there are studies for um, so many other different actions that the uh, drug has. So this is the study that was published last year. Um, this is SURPASS-1. So this is a you know, randomized control trial of terzepatide uh, once a week. Um, and this showed important uh, glucose loading effects uh, towards near normal ranges with the robust weight loss uh, of a magnitude not previously reported in people with diabetes uh, and without an increase in hypoglycemia. So the uh, advantages that it has is um, was a bit more than what you would expect from uh, just GLP-1 alone. So this combination was quite uh, effective. So this is the data that you have from this particular study. So you can see here, this is the control group who received placebo. So they're maintaining their A1C at around 8%. This is at 40 weeks. And you can see here that the drop in the A1C is quite large and significant, uh, going down to 6% um, on the uh, three different uh, doses. Uh, this is the change in A1C that you have uh, with the three, three doses, and this is the effect with the uh, placebo. These are the percentage of um, uh, participants who will reach uh, this goal. And you can see here that you're getting almost 80 to 90 percent of individuals reaching a goal of less than 7 percent. They're having more than 80 percent uh, reaching goal of less than 6.5 percent. And um, at the highest dose, which is 15 milligrams once a week, you're getting half the people getting to A1Cs, which are actually in the normal range. So this has got a robust effect on uh, glucose lowering. And um, this is the change in the fasting glucose. You're getting about 40 to 50 milligram per deciliter drop in the um, fasting glucose levels. And this again is your you know, drop in the fasting glucose that you have from 150 to about 100. Um, so you're having a tremendous impact on the uh, glucose response. Uh, and when you look at the weight, again, you will see here uh, anywhere from 8 to 11 percent at 40 weeks compared to 0.9 percent uh, uh, in the placebo group. This is the weight change from baseline in terms of uh, kilograms. And uh, this is the, again, uh, the actual weight. They started around 85 uh, and went down to about 76 kilograms. And these are the changes in the lipids. You see a significant drop in triglycerides, total cholesterol, increase in HDL, and a decrease in LDL. So, um, so you have a whole range of effects that you have. And you see greater than 5% weight loss and more than 70% of uh, individuals who got this uh, medication. As you know, any drug that can cause a weight loss of more than 5% um, could be approved as a weight loss medication. This is uh, 40, uh, anywhere from 30 to 45%, uh, more than 10%. And then here you have weight loss of 27, getting it more than 15% uh, weight loss. So there is a, a, a large uh, effect on weight and a, a significantly um, uh, impressive effect on uh, on diabetes. So um, there are now a whole series of surpass trials which are ongoing and you know we have some of these results that are available. Uh, many of them and particularly the cardiovascular outcome trials uh, will be uh, reported uh, over you know in the next year or so. So we will know more definitively as to what the uh, effects are going to be uh, from the, this particular uh, drug. So that again raised this question because as I said, with GIP, we had to go back and look at what is the physiology and how is it working? Because as I said, 
uh, initially when we when all the physiology was studied it did not have as much of a robust effect as we thought you know as, as the clinical trials have shown so they went back and looked at what it actually does so this was actually the study was being done even before they started um, all I mean this was part of the surpass trial so prior to that they were doing it but then they did the analysis and all this actually this was published after the surpass results were published so this is a very detailed study. Uh, they actually looked at the uh, CLAMP studies using um, and comparing it with uh, semaglutide uh, to see what is the mechanism by which uh, this particular uh, drug, the GIP, GLP-1 uh, receptor, dual agonist, is going to be, uh, will do. So, so this is a study where they, this is a multi-center study. These are people 20 to 74 years, had type 2 diabetes for at least six months, uh, treated with lifestyle uh, advice and stable dose metformin with or without additional uh, stable dose of another oral uh, antihyperglycemic medicine three months before the study entry. So these are not people who were on insulin or anything like that, because if you want to study insulin secretion, it is not a good idea to study people who are already on insulin, because that means they have uh, a much severe uh, secretory defect. So the primary endpoint was the effect of terzepatide uh, versus placebo on change in clamp, clamp disposition index. So the disposition index, uh, for those who are familiar with uh, clamps and uh, glucose tolerance tests, is a measure by which you're adjusting the insulin secretion to insulin sensitivity. So you expect people with, who are insulin resistant to have more insulin secretion. So simply looking at higher insulin secretion doesn't tell me if the drug is doing better. But if I adjust it for insulin uh, resistance, it'll tell me whether it has a true effect on either insulin secretion or does it simply work on insulin resistance. So uh, that is something that we can do. So the other endpoints they looked was, you know, um, compared it with semaglutide. So the first thing is to just the drug itself and whether it is any different from uh, semaglutide. So this is kind of the summary uh, table that you have. These are the clamp results uh, from in the pharmacodynamic analysis set. So this is the clamp disposition index at baseline and 28 weeks. And you can see here, this is the disposition index. And, you know, uh, this is at baseline. They're all very similar. This one here is the, uh, at 28 weeks, the placebo. This is semaglutide. So you can see the semaglutide does improve uh, islet function because it, when you increase the disposition index, it means that for change in insulin resistance, there is an appropriate change in insulin secretion. So it improved islet function. Um, but the thing was that when compared to one milligram semaglutide, the 15 milligram terzepatide uh, 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 did better. I mean, it had uh, increased to 2.3 percent. So this one here is the um, first phase uh, insulin response, uh, looking at the baseline, uh, and then at 28 weeks, again, you know, very similar or slightly uh, higher uh, in terms of. Uh, the first phase insulin response to the second phase insulin response. So this is what it is. This is the first phase insulin response that you get um, with the two drugs. Um, and then, you know, this one is the second phase. This is the whole of the second phase. Um, and then what they did here was at the end of the uh, second phase at 120 minutes, they did give them a bolus of glucose and then again looked at the insulin secretion. So some people do it early, some people, you can choose at what time you want to do the, uh, the bolus to look at the uh, insulin response, uh, the maximum insulin response that you can get. And you can see here that, you know, there's a robust uh, increase in insulin secretion. And this one is really talking about the glucose infusion rate. So that means that um, if you have more glucose being infused, it means that you're more sensitive to insulin. That means to maintain the glucose at a particular constant level, you need more insulin. That is because you're more sensitive to the insulin. Uh, you need more glucose. So what you see here is that we, we represent it by the M value, which is the milligram per minute per kilogram body weight. Uh, that is the uh, rate at which they had to be infused. And this is baseline. And you can see here that there is a significant improvement in M value, uh, which basically means that this particular drug not only increases insulin secretion, 
both first phase and second phase. Uh, it improves beta cell function, which is measured by the uh, disposition index, and it also improves um, insulin sensitivity. So the, the two primary defects that we consider in diabetes, insulin secretion and insulin resistance, are both um, affected uh, positively by both drugs, by both semaglutide and terzepatide. Uh, terzepatide at this dose had a higher effect than what uh, semaglutide alone did. So they looked at it and said that the glycemic eff efficacy of GIP, GLP-1 receptor agonist uh, in type 2 diabetes results from concurrent improvements in key components of diabetes pathophysiology, beta cell function, insulin sensitivity, and also glucagon um, secretion. Uh, these effects were large and helped explain the remarkable glucose-lowering uh, ability of terzepatide seen in phase 3 studies because really, you know, even before they did all this analysis, the phase three studies were out and they were showing a, a, a large difference. So that's one of the things that you have. So basically, if you want to sum up this thing right now, if we want to talk about what is happening uh, with these two uh, classes of drugs, the, the incretins, uh, GLP-1 and GIP, um, the, you know, there are some effects um, that are seen in the brain, the heart, the pancreas, the stomach, the gut, uh, adipose tissue, the kidney, uh, bones, and blood vessels. And here, um, you know, with respect to GIP, we don't know exactly. We know that GIP receptors are present in the brain, but their function is unknown. Uh, heart itself, no major effects are known. Um, with respect to GLP-1, there are some effects that have been demonstrated, and I'll show that uh, later. And with the pancreas, you know, we know that it increases glucagon, increases insulin, so on some of the statin, whereas GLP-1 increases insulin, decreases glucagon, and increases some of the statin uh, secretion. This has no significant impact on gastric emptying, maybe a bit of effect on gastric, uh, astric, uh, acid secretion, but as GLP-1 does decrease gastric emptying and um, you know, not much of an effect on gastric uh, secretion. In terms of absorption, uh, it does slow transit, uh, whereas here it actually increases hexose uh, absorption. In the adipose tissue, uh, there is browning of adipose tissue. This is a questionable thing. This is mostly animal models. Uh, and then here you have this direct effect that you have um, uh, of in increasing uh, lipoprotein lipase, free adipocyte differentiation, increased triglyceride storage, uh, and the question of weight gain. So one of the things is that it is this combination effect when you use terzepatide, um, because it has both GLP-1 and GLP and GIP, uh, the thing is some of the effects of GLP-1 in terms of weight uh, are going to be prominent and you will lose weight. And some of the effects that are related to um, insulin secretion um, are probably more GIP related. Uh, these are things that need to be worked out. We're not 100% sure exactly what all happens. Now, as I said, uh, in addition to diabetes, does, uh, these drugs have significant impact on weight. So this is the study from the New England Journal uh, 2021, looking at once weekly semaglutide in adults with overweight and obesity. And again, you see here, uh, semaglutide causes uh, a significant uh, weight loss. This is up to 16% at uh, 68 weeks. Um, change in body weight. Um, so, you know, this is the change from baseline uh, that you see um, on. So one is the um, in-trial data and the other is on treatment data. Basically, that includes in-trial in means that all people uh, who were enrolled, this is uh, in treatment. Uh, on treatment means they actually took the drug till the, la till the end. So these numbers you will see are different as to how many uh, were there in the uh, in the in the two groups, and then you have the uh, changes that you see in percentage uh, weight loss. So you'll find more than uh, five percent. You will get about uh, I think around sixty-five. Uh, is it eighty-five percent? Uh, this is sixty-nine percent, fifty-six percent, and thirty-two percent. So you can see that uh, this drug has a significant impact on uh, weight at uh, different. Um, and, you know, uh, levels of uh, obesity. You also look at some of the other endpoints, and it has beneficial effect that you will see. This is just the body weight change compared to placebo. 
Um, but when you also look at other things, you'll have a significant decline in uh, waist circumference of minus 13.3, uh, systolic blood pressure of about minus 6, uh, and then you have a kilogram body weight that you have uh, differences, systolic blood pressure, and also in the SF36 scores. So overall, you know, uh, it has a positive, positive impact on multiple parameters that cause a decrease in A1C. Uh, so uh, this drug has, you know, currently, of course, uh, semaglutide uh, is approved uh, for use in obesity uh, at a dose of uh, 2.4 uh, milligrams once a week, and you dose titrate it. And then there are a number of other studies uh, with other GLP-1s, uh, including liraglutide. This is the Saxenda, which is the higher dose that you have. And you get variable uh, weight uh, results uh, in different studies. This is the pediatric obesity study um, uh, that you have, um, where the weight loss more than 5% was seen about 43% of the uh, individuals who were enrolled. Now, this is the STEP uh, trials, so these are all semaglutide at different doses uh, compared with either placebo or with uh, some active comparator uh, uh, at times. And so these also, uh, some of them are ongoing and many of them have been completed and you see anywhere from 10% to 16.7% reduction in weight and you get a significant number greater than 5% uh, weight loss of 80 percent plus and more than 15 percent, you're getting about half of them uh, getting that uh, degree of uh, weight loss. So, uh, which is the reason that they have uh, impact on uh, and have been approved. These are the uh, surmount trials. Uh, surmount is the uh, weight loss uh, in the non-diabetic uh, individuals. Um, and there is surmount 2, which is uh, exclusively type 2 diabetes with um, um, Obes overweight and obesity. So this is all uh, with the terzapatide, and these are all ongoing trials and the outcome trial here that we have. So um, all of these trials have shown that the semaglutide, the GLP-1 analog, can cause significant amount of weight loss. Then you have uh, terzapatide once weekly for obesity. This was published um, a couple of months ago uh, in the New England Journal, and again, you can see here that the 15 milligram causes, uh, a, you know, percent weight loss of 20.9 percent. So there's a, a large drop in weight that you see um, with the um, terzepatide. And the percent individuals uh, reaching more than 20 percent weight loss here with the highest dose is about uh, almost 50 percent. And then you have about 36 percent. Uh, at more than 25% uh, weight loss. So again, this is a, a very large weight loss, very similar that uh, to some of the bari bariatric surgery. In fact, you know, um, certainly more than banding. So there is a, a huge amount of uh, benefit that you have. Uh, there are certainly some potential side effects, more than probably about 15 to 20% had to uh, stop the medication for, for adverse events. Uh, in pooled analysis, but in this particular study, you can see here treatment discontinuity of 4.3%, 7%, 6.2% uh, at these uh, different uh, doses that they have. So again, what you see here is that when you look at secondary endpoint, um, in addition to the weight loss, uh, there is a decrease in triglycerides, uh, there is a decrease in fasting insulin, um, decrease in non-HDL cholesterol, increase in HDL cholesterol, uh, diastolic blood pressure, total cholesterol, LDL, uh, free fatty acids. So overall, there is a significant improvement in weight and uh, lipid parameters in people who have received this. So this is the uh, list of, you know, what happened over the years from trying, you know, levothyroxine was the first weight loss drug that was used in 1890. And now we have uh, semaglutide that is approved uh, for use. Um, then you have the Contrave um, that has been uh, approved. Then you have Qsimia. Um, you must remember that there are a whole number, a large amount of drugs that came and went because uh, they had to be withdrawn uh, from the market. And 
the latest one to be withdrawn was actually Lorcaserin. So currently we have, uh, in terms of approved medications, fentermine uh, topidomate combination, Saxenda, which is liraglutide, you have the naltrexone bupropion uh, combination contrave, and then you have the Govi, which is uh, semaglutide. So these are the available drugs that you have. And when you look at it uh, from the FDA approval things that you are uh, looking at how much weight loss you can get, the most weight loss that you can get currently are with the new uh, GLP-1s and the um, GIP uh, uh, peptides that you will have the most uh, weight loss that you can get. So this, then you come to the cardiovascular benefits of these. So as I said, it has a significant impact on diabetes. It has a significant impact on weight, uh, the GLP-1s and the GLP-GIP combination medications. And then when you look at cardiovascular outcomes, again, there are studies that are uh, already out and many that are uh, ongoing, uh, which led to the approval of labeling as, you know, cardiovascular indication uh, for subcutaneous semaglutide, for liraglutide, and for dilaglutide. So all of these have, um, based on uh, particular studies, this is the SUSTAIN-6, uh, this is LEADER, and uh, Rewind. So all of these have um, been able to get approval for the, uh, for the uh, use as, um, for cardiovascular protection. This is the, um, Overall, you know, when you look at all these different uh, studies, what you're going to see is the benefit that you're going to look at the hazard ratio of major adverse cardiovascular events. And these are the different uh, drugs that have been used. And when you look at the meta-analysis of um, individual cardiovascular endpoints like MACE, myocardial infarction, stroke, cardiovascular uh, outcomes, all-cause mortality, and hospitalized and heart failure. So this is when you look at uh, all of these uh, different um, GLP-1 uh, analogs, uh, that you will find that they have a significant benefit in terms of cardiovascular outcomes. So there have been a, a large number of studies, uh, ELIXA, EXCEL, Harmony, LEADER, REVINE, SUSTAIN-6, PIONEER-6, AMPLITUDE, SOUL, which is ongoing or uh, things almost complete. Um, results are expected here, and they surpass CVOT. So, so one of the interesting things about these is that uh, back in 2008, uh, when the Accord trial uh, was being done, and they had to stop it, and because of um, adverse cardiovascular outcomes, that's when the CV outcome trials uh, actually started, because it was required for every new diabetes drug. And um, we have complained about it that it is too burdensome. But I don't know if we would have gotten all this information about cardiovascular benefits if those trials were not done, because these are uh, difficult to do, they're expensive, and of course, you know, pharmaceutical industry has interest in doing these because, you know, one, they want to market the drug, and without doing the trial, they can't do it. So we have actually benefited from what was not a great idea uh, to start these uh, uh, outcome trials as a requirement for approval. So, so again, you know, one of the confusing things even with these is that the cardiovascular outcomes uh, also seem to be a bit out of proportion to what we would expect from uh, diabetes control or weight loss. So there seems to be multiple effects of um, the GLP-1 uh, receptor agonists uh, on how they actually reduce uh, cardiovascular uh, disease. So um, they have been postulated uh, from reduced inflammation, blood pressure lowering, including its effects on ANP release from atrial cardiomyocytes, increase in arterial function, nitric oxide production, and then beneficial action on uh, decreasing cardiomyocyte apoptosis, increased diastolic function, increased cardiac glucose metabolism. So there, there have been a lot of studies that have looked at these things. And one of the limitations of many of these mechanisms are these are mostly identified in small rodents, uh, where it is easy to manipulate. You can knock out one or the other and then try to study them. Uh, but we, we really still need to know in humans uh, exactly what happens and how we can 
kind of understand better because not everyone benefits and still there's a large number of uh, people who will suffer from um, bad outcomes with diabetes and obesity. So understanding these mechanisms will actually open ways for uh, newer approaches to addressing this uh, particular problem. Not only is that the, the case in terms of overall, but what it does is when you look at uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, looking at from addressing risk factors uh, like you know diabetes, uh, hypertension, dyslipidemia, looking at atherosclerosis and, and formation of plaque uh, to ischemia, atherothrombosis, uh, arrhythmias. I mean, it doesn't seem to have much on arrhythmias. Uh, left ventricular remodeling. So there seems to be that there is an overall impact of the GLP-1 analogs and several. Uh, aspects of the cycle of uh, uh, cardiovascular disease from risk factor to death. Uh, so uh, these are things that we have to look at. Uh, and then I'll go with uh, another area that has been studied with this, which is NASH. Uh, NASH, again, you know, we talked about, in fact, last year we had three talks on NASH, uh, I think three or four talks on NASH and cardiovascular disease. And one of the things there is that we know that um, NASH increases the risk of diabetes and diabetes increases the risk of NASH and fibrosis. And both of these together will increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. So diabetes has increased cardiovascular disease, NASH increases cardiovascular disease. And there are two particular drugs, the uh, thiazolidine diamond, the PPAR gamma agonists and GLP-1 receptor analogs, um, both have a uh, significant impact on uh, NASH and also on cardiovascular disease. Um, so, you know, these are drugs that are of interest uh, to study. This is uh, from the Banting lecture from this year, uh, looking at this was on uh, type 2 diabetes and, and NAFLD. Um, and, you know, one of the studies that we have, uh, which was published last year, I think in July, uh, was the study of the, you know, placebo control trial of semaglutide in NASH. And again, what we found here uh, with NASH, uh, this used a different dosing regimen, uh, which was a daily injection of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, or 0 0.4 milligrams of semaglutide, looking at resolution of NASH without, with no worsening of liver fibrosis. And this one is improvement in fibrosis with no worsening of, uh, of uh, NASH. So you have a significant effect of uh, semaglutide. So, um, what we have is that um, the GLP-1 analogs also seem to have an impact on NASH. So when we looked at this, um, as people were developing the double agonist, uh, obviously we know that glucagon is another player in this. After all, um, the GIPs and the GLPs all came out by studying glucagon. And now they are coming out with a, what we call a triple agonist. So there is um, a lot of interest in developing peptide-based multi-agonists. So we know that, you know, we talked about how GLP-1 has all these different effects and then how GIP can affect the brain, the pancreas, and the white adipose tissue. And then you have glucagon, which also has different effects on cardiomyocytes, brown adipose tissue, liver, uh, insulin sensitivity, uh, and also on the pancreas. So, so uh, one of the things that has been uh, a subject of interest is to use multi -agonists. In fact, the point where we now have uh, drugs like, you know, you can actually have a GLP-1 estrogen, um, uh, you know, uh, analog. So one of the things that it does is that it increases weight loss without having any of the other uh, effects of uh, estrogens uh, because it is bound and it is attached to the GLP-1. So it only goes to uh, cells that have the GLP-1 receptor. So the same thing with uh, GLP-1 and dexamethasone, um, and you have the uh, GLP-1, the glucagon and T3 combination. So they have been trying to use uh, multiple different uh, agents, and then you have the GLP-1 glucagon, GLP-1 GIP, which we already have, and then the triple agonist. So this is a field that is developing where uh, there are, you know, peptide-based multi-agonists that are being developed for different drugs. And this is the, uh, the latest one that you have where actually they have done a human trial, which is a very early preclinical uh, trial looking at uh, humans. Uh, they did some in, um, 
in primates uh, initially, and then they have done a human trial looking at the effect of this uh, combined GLP-1 glucagon GIP receptor agonist. And it does have um, significant impact on um, plasma glucose during a mixed meal tolerance test, decreases biomarker levels of uh, all three targeted receptors. So uh, we have to see how these will uh, develop. Now, I wanted to close this thing by talking about, okay, we have all of these uh, benefits that you have, and we see a lot of people getting these drugs. So does that mean that um, the treatment of diabetes should be uh, GLP-1 based or what it should be? And so this is a very nice uh, article which was um, uh, authored by two people who came here last year uh, or who gave grand rounds, uh, Bob Eckel and Dr. Aroda. Uh, this is about how we should not lose sight of hyperglycemia. That hyperglycemia is at the, you know, core of diabetes-related complications. And this, they have used the EDIC trial, which is the continuation of the Diabetes Control and Complications trial, showing that, you know, how with conventional therapy, even when, you know, they are continued over time, 25 years later, you will see that there is a higher risk of myocardial infarction. And when you look at it here, 57% reduction in non-fatal stroke uh, non-fatal MI stroke or cardiovascular death uh, in this particular portion. That means after 10 years of treatment, uh, even though, you know, there was a, a A1C, the mean A1C was the same, they had a significant uh, improvement. So the other thing is when you're looking at microvascular complications, which are related, you know, significantly to glycemic control, the more uh, complications you have, one, two, or three, it doesn't matter what your blood pressure is or what your uh, LDL cholesterol is, that if you have more microvascular disease, you will have more macrovascular disease. So for that reason, it's important to control that. So their thing that they wanted to mention was microvascular predicts, uh, the disease predicts macrovascular disease. Achieving and maintaining glycemic control plays a critical role in reducing microvascular complications. Separately and independently, glycemic control agents from SGLT2 inhibitors, GLP-1 uh, uh, receptor agonist class have been shown to reduce CV risk factors and uh, risk in individuals. And both achievement of glucose control and choice of appropriate therapy are equally important to reducing risk of complications. And one size does not fit all, so HbA1c goals need to be uh, tailored, and you should avoid therapeutic inertia. And then physiologic control is associated with low risk of CV complications. Monitoring technology has the potential to facilitate more physiologic control and guidance. That means reducing variability, preventing hypoglycemia, these are things that will actually overall help. And so these are things that we have to address. Um, that, you know, if, you, if the uh, glycemic control, you must remember that all the trials that I showed uh, with diabetes, their primary endpoint was getting glycemic control. The secondary ones was cardiovascular outcomes. So all of them who did well actually got good glycemic control uh, on top of whatever additional benefits they have. So we should not forget that. So what are the barriers to prescribing glucose-lowering therapies for cardiometabolic disorder? You know, and this is from the American Heart Journal. And basically, um, so they are unique for endocrinology, primary care, and cardiology providers. That means each of them have different, you know, uh, uses of these, and you will find some people more comfortable using a particular drug as opposed to others. And when they looked at it, what they found was that, um, this is a couple of years ago, and it may be better now, uh, that endocrinologists were uh, kind of very comfortable with using GLP-1s and SGLT-2 um, uh, inhibitors. Um, but cardiologists and um, primary care were less, and particularly uh, for cardiology, they were not very comfortable using uh, many of these agents. And this is a, a kind of a letter uh, which kind of makes this bold statement about the generalizability of SURPASS-2 trial effect on U.S. diabetes and obesity control. So in this it says, in the U.S. eligible population, complete uptake of 15 milligram terzeptide means they're taking 5 million people and giving them terzepatide. 
you know, what will happen to that? It means the mean A1C for the population will come down from 8% to 5.7%, decrease the proportion of obesity from 70% to 41%, and BMI distribution will change the net, and this will change it. But of course, there are several limitations to, our, to the study uh, that survey data are subject to response bias. Second, we do not factor cost into consideration, and the simulation uh, on treatment effects does not take into account treatment heterogeneity. So, no, that's something that we have to keep in mind. So, in that lecture that I talked about with Nash, the Banting lecture at the American Diabetes Association, they talked about how we have identified the problem as a public health problem and impacts health care. Uh, there is now, you know, research uh, advice and awareness, and then there is lobbying groups to put pressure, and then you have the strategy and policy for NF NAFOLD uh, that will actually eventually affect change in, in a large scale. And a similar thing, um, this is uh, from the uh, cardiology uh, people um, talking about how you know, you need to, we have trial evidence uh, which will lead to guideline recommendations and consensus statements. But there are a whole lot of other things uh, uh, that have to take place uh, for final improvement in outcomes, including patient education, decision making, cost, financial assistance, uh, rational drug prescribing. So there are a whole la uh, multiple layers that are involved in trying to get to translating what these trials and the basic science uh, has shown us. So I'll end with this. Um, this is the uh, thing that the new and uh, evolving knowledge of endocrinians and chronicrinians has expanded the scope of uh, pharmaceutical interventions in management of cardiometabolic disorders. Our understanding has been uh, needs to be revised in view of recent trial data. And a comprehensive and integrated approach to management of cardiometabolic disorder, uh, disorders requires a multidisciplinary effort. Uh, this was uh, from the JCM uh, publication a couple of years ago, uh, talking about how cardiometabolic medicine covering uh, endocrinology, hepatology, nephrology, nutrition and exercise science, obesity medicine, and cardiology um, should all be you know, working together to try and improve uh, outcomes in this. And I'll end my talk here and invite um, any questions. Thank you comments. so much, Sri. Uh, this that really was spectacular, Sri. And uh, as a recovering cardiologist, uh, I, I have to comment that, um, like the data that you showed, we have increasing levels of frustration on the academic side with. Uh, implementation of really all our guidelines, but this is one particular area where the data keeps accumulating. And the last data that I saw, which Bob Eckel was actually one of the co-authors, uh, showed that we were up to, we had a dramatic increase in prescriptions from cardiology by 2020. It was up to 1.5% of all <laughs> prescriptions. And we're, we're just not getting it. And, you know, we're talking about drugs that, as you showed, uh, in, in addition to the lipid lowering, uh, there's endothelial functional improvement that uh, helps you out when a person has ischemic heart disease, the drop in weight, the drop in blood pressure. There's, if you could ever ask for something that would just work on multiple mechanisms outside of a vegan diet, which actually does the same or very similar uh, kind of thing, these are the drugs and you know, not just the GLP-1, but the SGLT-2 uh, inhibitors. And I, I would say that what we really need, probably for all of our guidelines, is implementation tools. And anything you can think of, and the obvious one here is to have you come and give this talk to cardiology. They're giving it, you know, that you could say that you're preaching to the choir. Uh, and I mean, actually, you're giving all the details that, uh, that uh, enhance the science of it and stimulate research. But in terms of practice, you guys get it already. Uh, we need to have it through, and, and primary care gets it, but we need it in cardiology as well. Any thoughts? Sir? Well, you know, yeah, th this is one of the big challenges that we face in trying to get um, appropriate uh, treatment for our patients, which it requires a lot of coordination. Um, so, again, you know, the hoops that we have to go through to get these medications um, and, you know, the cost certainly is a factor, but even otherwise, you know, um, trying to uh, train individuals on getting these approvals, 
uh, training them to take the medications properly. And um, I am a strong believer in basic diabetes and uh, nutrition education for all our patients uh, because uh, I think that is the baseline. Everybody puts it in their guidelines, but nobody pays attention to it. Because if you look at it, you know, that will be there all along. It doesn't matter what, whether it's hypertension or lipids or anything. Let's say lifestyle change, but nobody really pays attention to it. Uh, but you know, that's something that we have to work with uh, with them. And um, the best way is to you know, make it easier for people to um, talk to each other and ask questions. You know, the, the things that we face uh, at times is when people are on multiple diabetes medications and when somebody else adds another medication, uh, then it becomes a bit of a problem um, where they are hypoglycemic or they develop some other uh, problem with it. And those are things that, um, you know, patients have to be very aware of. And that's one of the things that makes people not write these drugs uh, because they're not following them closely. So I think, um, uh, co-management with different specialists is what is needed, you know. Uh, if you do it individually, it's going to be very tough. Uh, and that's what have been talking with Dr. Caldera. We'll see how it'll go, uh, where we can, you know, do these things. Because we are not comfortable, you know. Bob Eckel was here last year giving grand rounds on cardiometabolic medicine fellowship as his uh, favorite thing. And one of the things there is that as endocrinologists, we're not comfortable with imaging, we're not comfortable with when they complain of you know, swelling or this or that, and cardiologists are not comfortable when they talk about you know, uh, things that are not directly cardiology related. So, so that's why I think it's necessary for us to uh, put these things together and make it easier for everyone. Yeah. I agree completely, and you know, this is part of the uh, sales pitch to the dean that is, you know, we're going to break down some silos and have a cardio rheumatology and, you know, a, you know, we have uh, cardio oncology. We, we have opportunities uh, to, to really remove some of the barriers of working with each other and cardio metabolic is one of the ones that set up in Western is highly successful getting people uh, working with the hepatologist and the bariatric surgeon with cardiology and endocrinology all together in a, um, in a co-management clinic. So, I think you have the right idea. We just have to execute. Thank you. So there was a question here on the chat. Is there a glucose release via urine and the glucose luring ability of terzepatide? Um, no, I know it, it does not have any effect on uh, uh, renal glucose uh, and glycosuria. So the effect, uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors would have, but not uh, the GLP-1 analogs uh, in terms of re uh, glucose excretion. No. Any other questions? Okay. If there are no other questions. We will adjourn. We'll meet again next week. So much. Take care.